ARDS, or acute respiratory distress syndrome, is caused by an injury to the lungs. As I think of acute processes with the kidneys, think of an acute process within the lungs. There are mild forms of ARDS, known as acute lung injury, or ALI, and then more severe forms where mortality is very high, especially when comorbidities exist, such as cardiac and renal disease. The degree of hypoxemia is what determines the severity of this syndrome. The definition of ARDS follows. It is a form of acute lung injury that severely affects the ability of the lungs to exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide. When you think of conditions where the alveoli are full of fluid, heart failure may come to mind. But what is so impressive about this syndrome is that the heart function in these patients is completely normal. This will make more sense in a bit when I talk about what actually fills the alveoli. ARDS is not a disease process, but rather it is a result of something that either directly or indirectly affects lung function, and it is acute. The signs and symptoms present themselves very abruptly. A chest X-ray may be normal upon admission, but within 24 to 48 hours, the alveoli are full of fluid and the patient becomes very sick. The pulmonary artery wedge pressures are normal, indicating normal left ventricular function. If you haven't learned about wedge pressures yet, you will. Here is a picture of diffuse bilateral opacities on a chest X-ray. The lungs typically on a chest X-ray are black, as you are looking for air-filled alveoli. Once something fills the alveoli, it now appears white. In pneumonia, you may see this opacity in one lobe, but definitely not all over. Therefore, the hallmark sign of ARDS is refractory hypoxemia. No matter how much oxygen you administer to the patient, they are showing very outward signs of respiratory distress. Their blood gases show low levels of oxygen and their pulse oximeters are basically in the toilet. So let's talk a little bit about pathophysiology. Initially, there is an insult to the lungs, either directly or indirectly. I will address this later. But because of this insult, there is a huge inflammatory response resulting in increased capillary membrane permeability. What also occurs is there is an amassing of neutrophils, macrophages, and platelets to the area in an effort to repair the injury. The pulmonary capillary membranes become leaky and substances that normally can't get into the alveoli like proteins now move in. That protein-rich fluid now filling the alveoli does a couple of things. First, it impairs gas exchange, as oxygen and carbon dioxide cannot exchange through thick fluid. All of the other products of inflammation move in. This protein-rich fluid also damages surfactant, necessary to keep alveoli expanded. This affects not only gas exchange, but lung compliance and the alveoli become stiff. Due to the developing hypoxemia, pulmonary vasoconstriction takes place, which can cause right-sided heart failure. What then is the result? Surfactant is severely compromised, so the lungs become non-compliant and stiff. Without surfactant, there is alveolar collapse, further compromising gas exchange. The alveoli are full of fluid, negating any hopes for gas exchange. And yes, you will hear crackles. Hypoventilation and poor gas exchange result in a mixed metabolic and respiratory acidosis. This is probably one of the best pictures I've found to help explain this process. The spaces in the capillary membrane open up and plasma proteins and red blood cells freely move into the alveoli. When capillary membranes remain tighter, typically this cannot occur because those substances are too big. The type two alveolar cells are what produce surfactant. When covered with protein-rich fluid, they no longer work. 
when protein moves out of the intravascular space and into the alveoli, it changes the osmotic gradient. Water follows protein. Any water and protein that do not reach the alveoli sit in the interstitial spaces and push on the capillary beds, making them even smaller. Many things can cause ARDS. Here are a few examples. What impacted the lungs directly, whether it be trauma or something that was inhaled? Did dirty fresh water or salt water get in from a near drowning incident? Did the patient aspirate gastric contents? Stomach acids and tube feedings have no place in the alveoli. Indirectly, sepsis and shock are the two most common causes or etiologies due to the presence of the inflammatory response and hypoperfusion to the lungs. The signs and symptoms are basically those of a patient having respiratory difficulty. They will be tachypnic and complain of difficulty breathing. They will be using accessory muscles to breathe and showing all the signs of hypoxia, including restlessness and confusion. Their lungs sound like washing machines, and I'm not kidding with that. Often they are running fevers due to what initially caused the problem and the inflammatory response. If a pulmonary catheter is inserted, the pressures would reveal normal left ventricular function. Therefore, pulmonary edema is ruled out as a cause of the hypoxemia. Even with all the technological advances, ARDS continues to be very difficult to manage and mortality rates are high. The two biggest goals are to identify and manage the cause as well as prevent further lung damage. Mechanical ventilation is still the mainstay treatment accompanied by neuromuscular blockade. So the patient will be on basically mus uh, medications that will paralyze them. Preventing the patient from moving helps reduce oxygen consumption. Along with these medications, the patient will require sedation. PEEP, or positive end expiratory pressure, is added to the ventilator in an effort to make the alveoli bigger to assist with gas exchange. Tidal volumes will need to be reduced as one complication in this case is barotrauma. Making the alveoli too big can cause them to rupture and now you have a pneumothorax. Too much PEEP also causes a decreased cardiac output as the intrathoracic pressure is increased, thereby reducing preload. Oxygen toxicity needs to be avoided as this can worsen capillary membrane permeability. The goal is to keep the FiO2 less than 60% and maintain the oxygen saturation greater than 90%. Inhaled nitric oxide may be used to attempt to vasodilate the pulmonary capillary beds in an effort to improve gas exchange. Inhaled surfactant therapy tends to work best in the pediatric population. So really, the mainstay th therapy is supportive. Prone con positioning continues to be one method to improve gas exchange, as placing the patient face down helps to recruit areas of the lungs not typically used when the patient is on bed rest. This, of course, will take a very skilled team to manage this maneuver, as safety is a huge issue. Losing the endotracheal tube or having IV catheters being pulled out could be devastating. Losing intravascular volume could result in renal failure, yet giving this patient too much fluid could accumulate in the alveol alveoli. So careful assessment and monitoring of the fluid volume status is key. The nurse must be vigilant to signs of infection as this would only compromise the patient's status. And importantly, nutrition must be maintained to help the patient through the healing process, most likely tube feedings unless the patient suffers from pancreatitis or curling ulcers secondary to severe burn injuries. This concludes this presentation. Please refer all questions to your instructor in class. Thanks for listening.